to yourself. And that makes it something that doesn't mean it gets a lot of attention, except in the most episodic of ways. there will be the equivalent of a Valdez spill of cyber stalking, and everybody will worry about it, and then it will sort of go away. It's very anecdotal, episodic, unlike, say, music, uh, unauthorized music sharing, which is something that we are made aware of as a real problem through the entities economically impacted uh, by it day by day. And when I hear the word help, it also to me signals it may already be awfully late in the process to do something about it. The point that somebody's saying help, the problem that might be solvable may already have entered its later phases. And uh, kind of as somebody who tries to research this stuff, I'm trying to figure out ways to make it so that you're not even getting to the place where you want to have to say help. And finally, the word I, not to deconstruct the entire title, but the word I is also interesting because it does make it such a solitary thing. You've got this one issue, it's uh, kind of a corollary of the aphorism coined uh, derivatively by my colleague uh, David Weinberger. On the internet, uh, everybody is famous for 15 people. And so there's like 15 people that might care about you. But if you're having some issue with that, it feels like you're totally exposed to the world. Like, oh my god, there's that web page out there that says something. It's like no one else cares, except maybe your stalker and you, which puts you in a really weird club. So these are some of the reasons why, uh, as I try to think about practical advice, and when it comes to practical advice, it means I have to do a slide that actually uh, has bullet points on it. But it's basically the practical advice of dealing with the lone wolf person who, for whatever reason, is out to make your life difficult. And that's already, again, a very difficult target to contend with on the internet because that person is spending some energy to howl in a targeted way at you, and now you're engaged in this one-on-one -on -one sort of thing trying to get out from under it. So here's the slides, it's practical advice um, in the classic traditional but reliable PowerPoint way, <laughs> which is, okay, if you're dealing with a lone wolf, what are the sorts of things you're, you're dealing with? And one is, are there ways to deal with this person? So I'm thinking it usually is a person. I guess there can be spam bots that are relentlessly stopping, but that's next year. Um, but in the meantime, if it is a person, how important is it to know who the person is? We're actually practically dealing with the problem as it exists online. It may not be that necessary. Some of the tools that Lisa talked about were tools that have to do with getting a page taken down, getting speech classified in a way that under the terms of service of the site you can be. Uh, dealt with, you may not need to know who it is, but for your own peace of mind, it can be awfully weird to have somebody coming at you and you just don't know the identity, at which point all the people you are interacting with, you're like, huh, is that you or is it someone else? And that sort of thing can make it very difficult. And then it gets to questions of, well, it, it really turns out to be important to you, either for your own peace of mind or for the purposes of getting the gears of law turning against that person, or trying to get them fired, or whatever it might be, um, how do you do it? And Lisa already talked a little bit about that. There are uh, public means in the rule of law. You would pursue a uh, some kind of subpoena or other administrative document to try to track down who they are through whatever service is offering them the means by which to say terrible things to you or about you. And I know it's funny for Lisa because she's often on the other side of it protecting a John Doe defendant against somebody who doesn't like what that person had to say and she's standing up for free speech. And then there are other times when you're like, I want to find out who that person is. Um, and it, again, makes it very difficult to come up with a policy that lets the good identifications to go forward um, and the ones that are not supposed to go forward, not go through. And that's why I said, you do have this question about kind of the rule of law, do you trust it? Do we want an internet in which it doesn't matter how much paperwork you have accrued and through what legal process, people can be unidentifiable if they want to be, in part because we collectively don't trust legal process these days? Or do you want an internet in which, yeah, you can get along mostly anonymously, but if the right sequence of paperwork happens with the public authorities, then you can find yourself uh, with a means to identify. Often when you ask lawyers and law students, they want that state of affairs. When you ask engineers, and mostly everybody else, they want the, I want utter technical anonymity, not just legal anonymity. Private means is something that we uh, may not have time to talk about right now, but could come up later, which is 
Some people have found ways by which to try to elicit an identity without going through the courts and some public means. So there are sites by which you can generate an email to go to somebody that loads in a picture of a happy wolf. And as that picture is loading in, it's coming from a server. It's a hyperlink that's being loaded automatically. And that picture was customized just for that email recipient. No one else would ever have reason to visit that deep link on that server. At which point, the mere act of their opening the email is an act of figuring out their IP address. Because they're the ones that visited to load the picture in. It's kind of an odd return receipt. You just send somebody a picture of a happy wolf, or a picture of your choice, it can be anything. Put it on the server, now you can find out who they are, which of course also means now people can find out who you are, completely determining the discussion about whether there should be some legal means by which to do a subpoena or other mechanism to get uh, the information. So again, on the practical front, if you find this happening, if you don't know how to do this yourself, it's the kind of thing you shouldn't try at home if you haven't already tried it at home, which makes you wonder how the first person did it. But in this case, uh, you should find somebody who has done it at home whom you trust, who can advise you. And uh, is it illegal to do that? I don't know. We could probably spend an hour on that. Um, and I'm not going to give you legal advice because I'm not licensed in Texas. And if I were, I certainly wouldn't give you legal advice because then it would be probably malpractice. Moving right along. Um, Lisa has already talked about the acceptable use policy in terms of service. And I did not know that Google, upon the right paperwork, will actually take out of it. Does it send these chilling effects? I wonder. Yeah, so I have several search results where if you go to certain pages about me, it says some of the web results have been removed from Google we search results. Here to see them. <laughs> no, it just says uh, you know the, the, because of a court action. Yeah, I, I'll pl I, I can put up a slide later. Yeah, that's great. I have no idea. That's quite troubling and interesting and <laughs> possibly good. I, I haven't thought about it yet. That's great. Um, then there's also questions. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. The link actually, though, will take you to chilling effects. Where you can see a generic, a generic chilling effects information page. Oh, it will take you to the notice that Google got, and that sent. Well, we'd have to check it out. We'll we have, look we it up. We could, we, we could all look it up. I just we can all look it up. Google. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. So um, <laughs> next is question of: uh, Are there ways prior to help that did help that you can try to do something? And that has to do with preemption. Are there ways to structure things? And I'll have a few thoughts on that. And finally, the idea of resilience. Are there ways that if there's bad stuff out there about you, you can somehow deal with it without having to get it literally taken down? If that's the nature of the problem, again, stalking is vague enough online. It might mean somebody harassing you directly, and you're the only audience, and there's nothing to take down. You just feel um, attacked and uh, demeaned. But in this case, the resilience uh, could mean any number of things. It could mean, for example, uh, one of my former students started something called reputation.com. Um, uh, so I'm on its advisory board, which has yet to be convened. That I know <laughs> they might be meeting without um, me. But anyway, reputation.com, uh, one of the things it does, or used to do in, in great uh, detail, I think, would be to go to websites where stuff that was bad about one of its clients proposed and blandish the site under its terms of service to try to take it. And say, we're not legally ordering you to, we're just asking you to kind of do the right thing. I think now a lot of what they do is search engine optimization. It's ways of trying to come up with Google hits because, I don't know, when's the last time you went to the third page of Google results for anything? Right. So as long as we get to page three, unless somebody is really trying to learn about you, then it's mostly hidden from you, even for your 15 fans, uh, for our 15 fans. And in that case, uh, reputation might be looking for ways to put other information out, classic search engine optimization and stuff. But back to preemption for a moment. And this is a dilemma that we all face. This is, uh, this is my lone wolf. And um, this is my Facebook timeline, which I have yet to publish, but it keeps telling me, like, it's time to either publish <laughs> or take the educational tour until you publish. Like, the only way you can graduate is to publish your timeline. And I don't, how many people have actually done timeline so far? Yeah? How many people are in this phase or just before it? Yeah, so you're waiting, you're taking the tour. We can do it together, perhaps. <laughs> but this is incredible, and we all know it, right? I am telling you the most trite thing, and yet here we are publishing timeline. Like, really? Really? I was born. Okay, I was born. Then a bunch of stuff happened, and then I joined Facebook. Like, that's right, on March 13th, 2004. 
I should have a Facebook anniversary. I mean, like, I should just have it. Like, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that's, that's very exciting. Like, right, and then a bunch of other stuff happens. And at some point, of course, Facebook is hoping you'll go and backfill. Like, yes, here are my baby photos. And that, this is when I did my first whatever thing that I can't say. So um, here, it's just like, really, really? People need to have a slider bar so that any instant, by just sliding the bar, they can figure out what I was doing on December 15th, 2008. Like, that, that is very strange. And we all know it's strange. And yet we're like, nah, I'm not going to look at it. Like, how many people started really reviewing their timeline? Yeah, no? Nobody reviewed their timeline? Only a few. You guys are just like that yeah, timeline, okay? <laughs> that's surprising to me. But that's what they're counting on, right? So this is a question then of preemption. If somebody actually wanted to stop you in the sense of dox you, in the sense of learn as much as they can about you, it doesn't get much better than you offering them a trove of everything you've done online ever yet. So thinking about how much we need to join this parade of things, and whether our timeline maybe should look more like that than like this, um, is, I think, a question uh, worth asking. And at the very least, there is this idea that if you should get nervous later, you can retroactively, because it's all within a walled, gar walled garden, close off parts of your timeline. And unless somebody had the foresight to capture it all ahead of time, that's a way of kind of trying to uh, have some information in control. But OK, to me, the interesting stuff, the stuff that makes this really about the internet, rather than incidentally about the internet, is when the lone wolf becomes multiple wolves. And when you have multiple wolves, you know, been there, got the t-shirt, that whole thing. When you have multiple wolves acting in groups, that's what the internet can really amplify, and it makes it different than just, there's a jerk in the real world following you around or stalking you or whatever. Now that jerk is in the online world. It's when you see it coalescing into group behavior that makes it significantly, to me, different from the online world. And so one of the interesting aspects of the ongoing, talking about Gifta keeps on giving, story of WikiLeaks, which my colleague Clay Shirky says, Julian Assange, the only thing he needs to be the perfect James Bond villain is a hairless cat. But um, <laughs> anyway, WikiLeaks is unfolding. And there's the documents that governments don't want you to see up on various websites. And we start to see denial of service attacks hitting those sites from anonymous groups of called wolves. And then as that happens, and as others also act against WikiLeaks, PayPal starts uh, to deny uh, financial transactions. Amazon takes down a mirror of WikiLeaks. You start to see other wolves coming on the other side of things doing denial of service attacks against the enemies of WikiLeaks. And it's just a real kind of crossfire environment. And so here's WikiLeaks in the news. Anonymous and Anon-Ops are stepping forward um, to help out WikiLeaks to do it through other denial of service attacks. And interestingly, uh, they're asking everybody to join the club. So here's the low orbit ion cannon that you can download to your own machine, pick the target of PayPal or whoever you don't like, and then just hit, I'm a charge in my laser, and away you go. This is a really interesting way of taking behavior that has a real world impact that many people would quite gravely say is like, you know, criminal, cyber terrorist, cyber warfare, behavior, very serious stuff, in a way that kind of has a bit of a, a sort of comical side to it. And it's that odd mix of, is this a game or is this not a game? that I think can end up leading to a lot of behaviors we end up describing in the cyber stalking context. In fact, the uh, Hacker Quarterly 2600 came out with a press release saying they thought that um, these sorts of denial of service attacks were wrong because hackers believe in the free flow of information and even going after PayPal or Amazon was wrong by that uh, account. And in the meantime, here's the part that's really interesting for our topic today. You ended up with an article uh, almost uh, just over a year ago in which a guy named uh, Aaron Barr, head of security services firm H.B. Gary Federal, said that he knew who was in Anonymous. He had done his own investigation. I don't know, is it stalking if it's done by a private investigator? I will solve the question. But he had infiltrated and tried to figure out who was in Anonymous and was about to say who it was. 
And Anonymous, within about 12 hours, decided they were going to go after him. Now, let me know about HP Barry Federal. This is from one of their PowerPoint decks where they sell their services to the tune of about a million or two million dollars a month. They offer computer network attack, custom malware development, oh, computer God. network exploitation. What does exploitation mean? Slurping all the information there. If you want to find out about somebody, you can write a check to HP Gary Federal, and they will quote unquote cyber stalk the person. But we don't call it that when it's on a PowerPoint slide from HP Gary. We call it um, <coughs> computer network exploitation using persistent software implants, which sounds like the kind of thing that could lead to a class action suit. Uh, uh, against the physicians who implant them, but that's <laughs> another story. So um, it's weird to see them being able to engage in the behavior, no longer the lone wolf now, but like a professional mercenary wolf pack. And um, they also, in one of their presentations to Bank of America, they wanted to sell Bank of America their services, pay us, and we will help you because you're supposed to be WikiLeaks as an ex victim. We will intimidate WikiLeaks and we will intimidate their donors by releasing false information about them, by doing all the sorts of stuff that Lisa was talking about, but now in a paid corporate context. And that remains, I think, a problem distinctly worth mentioning. Again, it gets to the definition of what is a stalker. But anyway, how do we know about all this? Because it's not like he announced that this is what he was doing. It's because Anonymous ended up infiltrating his entire uh, life. So they ended up uh, first compromising his Twitter account and then forced it to tweet his address and his social security number. <laughs> um, they took down the HP Gary parent website, which now a service attack, so much so that they could only put up this little message that was like, we are under a cyber attack, <laughs> help. And by the way, if you need technical support for our security <laughs> products, email us at support.hpgary.com. It's like, I don't think so. It's time to switch to a different security product. In the meantime, they took over the HP Gary Federal subsidiary website um, completely. They just denied all service. They like took it over and put up this message that says that their domain has been seized by anonymous under Section 14 of the Rules of the Internet, and um, you blindly charged into the hive and tried to steal the honey. Did you think the bees would not defend it? Well, you made it the hive, and now you're being stung. <laughs> and at the very bottom of the page on the HP Gary Federal website is the link to download all of the internal emails of HP Gary. Federal. So um, if you don't want to download them, you can just go to the convenient portal um, at a .ru address and um, just go to the portal and then just get a search for all of the emails. You can just do a convenient box you know, to see if you are mentioned or uh, whatever it might be. Now, is this a form of cyber stalking? I have lost track at this point because of the back and forth, the arms race going on, among others who see the ability to dox somebody. D0X for those uh, who may not be following what Dave's doing today. Um, <laughs> that kind of thing is a, an adjunct to what started off as a lone wolf, somebody just kind of has an infamy problem, into this kind of trench warfare. Um, of course, later it turned out that Anonymous suffered its own internal struggles. In fact, if you visited Anonymous' own site, you would get this warning because a fellow helper named quote unquote Ryan decided he didn't <laughs> like Anonymous anymore, but has all the keys to their kingdom. So please stay away from Anonymous.net. <laughs> they are compromised and don't believe anything you read from us anymore. So that's the kind of thing where you just realize it's like that movie Reservoir Dogs, where everybody is just aiming, I'm going to about to infringe copyright, aren't I? Aiming a gun at each other, and then they all shoot. In the meantime, somehow Anonymous is said to have attacked WikiLeaks. It's like, wait, they were your friend. Um, and just a couple of days ago, we got a great roundup from Ars Technica, which has at least two reporters who've been following the stuff wonderfully. And almost, um, uh, it's thought that almost all of the people behind the HP Gary hacks have now been arrested, in part because they were infiltrated by uh, others or others uh, ratted them out. So again, you see just how much ferment there is uh, around this. Now, um, it's obviously a Wikipedia entry on permanent death, but uh, it's not what you think. It's about in role-playing games, often in a multiplayer game, you get to pick your server. There's a kill server and a no-kill server. The no-kill server is one in which, even if somebody gets you with a hatchet, you don't actually die. You lose points or something, you keep going on. The kill server is, we all agree, this time it's for real. And you can build up a character and really lose your character. And that's a list of um, multiplayer games that used to allow permanent death, but don't anymore. Um, and uh, it's a very controversial thing. And 
My sense of it is that when it comes to online behavior that we often characterize as stalking, I think in the minds of many of the people doing it for the lulls, L-U-L-Z-S, they think of it as a game on a kill server. It's like, hey, I'm fair game, if you get me, you get me. You're fair game, I get you, I get you. And you're saying, wait, I didn't sign up for this. Can I please be on a no kill server? And it would be interesting to find out ways for people to be able to signal that, so it would be unsporting to dox them when they've already indicated that they're kind of running under uh, a flag of truce or not being interested in it. It's uh, reminiscent to me of my colleague David Clark's idea that IP addresses should be designated as either military or civilian for the purposes of cyber war. And you can do what you want as one military against another military IP addresses, but civilian IP addresses you should leave alone. It's both crazy and profoundly sane. So Wikipedia itself is worth looking at because that's a group of wolves who tend to be very friendly. Like maybe they're more like um, puppies in a way. I still regret saying that. But anyway, these are people that get together. They have, a, in the part of the wiki that's itself editable, a notice board where people can report incidents. And here's just one sample, right? It's just a list of problems on Wikipedia. Tendentious editing, somebody's attacking me for averting something. I like this one. A long story. <laughs> the Wikipedia editors go through and just read it. And they've got like their punch list. They're like, all right, I'll get the uh, anonymous editor. And it's like, okay, I'll do the long story. <laughs> And they fix it. And there's more people fixing stuff than there is stuff to fix, which is how Wikipedia remains good rather than a bunch of ads for Rolex watches. And that's a group of wolves then who have determined that their mission is to build an environment that has a certain kind of respect that Lisa was talking about too is the ultimate way to try to solve this problem. And I see it as an environment that is sort of outside regular legal channels, but the identity is one of Right, if, if anybody is on a kill server, it's Batman, right? He has definitely opted in. But he's opting in for the purpose of protecting the rest of the citizens who don't even know he's there and would throw him in jail if they could catch him kind of thing. And a great example was to be a Star Wars kid. How many people are familiar with Star Wars kid? Okay, so Star Wars kid from a few years ago now um, played with this uh, golf ball retriever, taped it, and uh, didn't realize it was still on the tape when he returned the equipment to his school from which he had borrowed it. His so-called friends then put it online and it became a huge internet meme and phenomenon. It racked up tons and tons of views. I think it was one of the most viewed videos ever now. This is from a long time ago when it only had 12 million views. Right, this was terribly depressing to him. If anybody is entitled to say, help, I have an internet stock for a blackmailer, <laughs> um, the only thing wrong is that Star Wars kid would have to say, I have many internet stalkers and blackmailers. And if you read the Wikipedia article about Star Wars Kid, of course there's one, what's most interesting is you will not find his name anywhere in it. And in fact, um, if you look on the discussion page, you will see the huge debate that Wikipedia had within itself on whether or not to mention his name. And the mainstream media had, but Wikipedians ended up through a, a lot of debate determining that they would not, that it was not material to the story, to understanding what the Star Wars kid was, and that it just wasn't nice, so they weren't going to do it. And that becomes a way to implement within its own law, within its own law of the site, as Lisa was calling it, some form of goodness that can have apprentices and adherents uh, to it. So uh, this is more of them uh, saying that they've already determined that they're not gonna mention the subject's real name, and uh, any attempt to put it in will be removed immediately to lead to sanctions. Of course, his name is all over the talk page because they're talking about it, but they know that people don't really read the talk page. So um, another example of this is this is a site, uh, Awkward Family Photos. If you can read seated <laughs> Awkward Family Pet Photos, all of those backdrop number four, if you call it Meadows, Hill Ground Pets. Is that an animal crisis? <laughs> it's like, Yes, I think that is a dead cow. So anyway, there's a bunch of these. They're very funny. And then you have one of them where it actually says, image removed at request of owner. So the image was there. The person right at the site took it. The owner was like, come on. And they're like, OK, you're right. It's awkward. We're going to take it off. And that's the kind of way in which you can start to see too easy, too easily. We don't just think of it as a game. That's, that's the, the, the lulzers. 
But even the people in the middle often just see the web as a bunch of static data to be copied, pasted, and forwarded if it's at all interesting. Do I like this? Do I forward this? Do I plus one this? I do all three. That's how good this is. And at some point, if there's a way to figure out that there's a person behind the data that might be impacted by what you do, and to have an opportunity just to think about it as an ethical moment, then I think you can improve the web. You can make it one in which less stalking happens or less impact happens from stalking because we are the magnifiers of it. We are the ones that make it, not just a scrap between two people. And I think with a little bit of help, you can see ways both offline and online. So this guy uh, doesn't agree to, sorry, there we are, does not agree to the publication <laughs> of this photo. <laughs> And you can even imagine configuring cameras so that it would automatically do this. And you can undo it if you insist. But that makes the moment by which you would try to figure out what you want to do with the data that you encounter and ricochet along with the gravity well of Jupiter speeding the spacecraft to the uh, outer edges of the solar system. And I want to see ways to generalize that phenomenon. This is the venerable robots.txt a standard that is throughout the web, but approved by no standards body. It just kind of happened on a mailing list. And this is the University of Chicago saying, here are some directories we would prefer that search engines not index. That was doing the good stuff, is, right? But nonetheless, search engines, all the major search engines, and not because the law requires them to, respect robots.txt. And they will not go where they are told. If we can come up with a robots.txt, for our social layer of the web, that would go such a long way to removing the viral part of internet so-called stalking. Again, I hate to use the word, but here it is. That viral part to remove it and get it better. Now, I just want to say a few words about um, real world and uh, online world too, with respect to data destruction. In the real world, of course, often um, there are lots of ways to shred that which you have generated. I love the accurate document destruction game. We bring new depth and dimension to document destruction. <laughs> accurate. It's like we only destroy the document. Good. Not you, just the document. Good. I'm not hiring you. But anyway, there isn't that easy equivalent online. But as we see more gated communities, that in another environment, I'm greatly worried about. One benefit of the gated community, as I already observed the Facebook timeline, is that you could go back and try to either affirmatively remove that which you don't like, and within that community it's gone and it hasn't been previously copied out of it. Or this was an old company that used to be called Disappearing Inc. And on um, I think it's gone now. But the idea, I love how the problem with email was it's as easy to distribute. <laughs> <laughs> that was the point that people <laughs> But anyway, the problem sometimes with email, as all of us know, we did send them Reddit, is that it can be really easy to distribute. What if your email were in a corporate system, they say, where each set of days' emails was encrypted with a certain key? And to get to it, every time you had to have that key. And the key comes from a central repository in your company. And then exactly two years later, if your document um, retention policy is two years, which is a document destruction policy, two years, they throw away that key. And when they throw away the key, everything that had been encrypted with it becomes unobtainable anymore. And you can see in, in Facebook and such wanting to have things like bit rot take place. Maybe when you hit your 18th birthday on Facebook, it should say, congratulations, would you like to review all of your photos and designate certain photos to disappear? Or maybe your photos should slowly fade out over time unless you affirmatively say, wait, I want to keep that picture of me holding beer, doing such and such. Uh, in timeline, that's not on Facebook's mind, but you can see it happening. Now, back to uh, just uh, abuse and behavior and such online. Um, YouTube comments voted worst thing on the internet. So yes, this is just, I'm glad you can't see them. The usual stuff on YouTube, apologies if you're a YouTube commenter or if you're coming on YouTube right now. But uh, in the meantime, we've seen site after site really worry about the kind of behavior that happens online. We would never dare to engage in offline this for 20 years now. What do you do about that? And I think we're starting to see ways in which that's evolving. I don't know if it's getting better, but it's evolving. So TechCrunch um, was in the site that had very bad comments. This is a bizarre program that Walmart has just announced. But anyway, at the end of that, you can actually see they're using the story Facebook commenting system. And that is now tied to your identity and photo. When you put in that comment, it's associated with your name as you do it. The hypothesis was that would make people less jerky online. 
I think it makes some people less jerky. It makes other people every bit as jerky as they are. They may not be able to help themselves. But if you are on the receiving end of that jerkiness, somehow to have a name and a photo, and maybe you can click through and say, oh, I see. They go to the University of Strathclyde. No offense to you. I just try to pick something to offend anybody. But then I realize there are people who go to the University of Strathclyde. They're just not here. So anyway, um, once you can find out who is saying it, it suddenly takes some of the sting out. It's no longer it could be anyone. It's like, oh, it's that person. OK, that's that person. Whatever. Thank you, person, for your stupid comment. <laughs> and um, that's where you can even see sites like this. I'm not racist. But where the guy that runs the site, who is anonymous, so maybe it's a guy or a gal, goes onto Facebook and just searches in the publicly available comments for anybody saying, I'm not racist, but, and then grabs it and puts it on this site permanently so their name and photo can be associated with any racist thing they say after they say, I'm not racist. But that creates a form of accountability made possible by a system that is starting to spread like Facebook commenting. And you also think about it, suppose your Facebook account gets terminated. What happens to every comment you left on every website? It might be a way, as Lisa was suggesting, of retracting something, or you end up becoming an anonymous silhouette everywhere on the web you have left a comment using the Facebook commenting system. Now, I teach across about ideas for a better internet. Uh, it's uh, every year a top of the Harvard and Stanford, and students have to come up with an idea for a better internet. So they sit for like three weeks, and like, I got nothing. And then they come up with something because they have to. So one of the things they were thinking about was taking sites like Clout and QNX, <laughs> where you could just kind of go and say, like, I'm a 56 today. <laughs> I feel very influential. And uh, you look at that, and then if you become less influential, you start tweeting like Mac. Listen to me. But anyway, they were thinking, why not take sites like this and imagine a site? So this is what they created. They created something called Moderator, which would be across lots of sites, kind of like the way a credit check draws from lots of people to whom you have owed money to find out if you pay your bills on time from, uh, among all of those entities. What if we could use it to actually draw in from various places where you have an identity and you are transacting with people information about how well you're doing. And that could then be made available back out again to any site that might ask for it with your permission. It means you could go to a site and establish yourself as a reasonable, non-trollish person. Without having to pay your dues there, you pay your dues elsewhere, and it becomes a currency that becomes fungible. And their idea actually was to give you um, four things, not just credibility, but how's your engagement, how's your social, how's your transactional, how's your helpfulness, and suddenly that becomes a currency that you want to earn. The minute you put points on something, as Jesse Schell has taught us, people want to earn points inexplicably. So if you can make points out of not being a jerk, especially jerky people who are really concerned about points, like either their heads explode, <laughs> or they start to earn points by simulating non-jerkiness. And you can even see doing it at the broader level by having an Alexa-like ranking for sites on whether or not they are known as sites that have a lot of jerks on them. And suddenly sites now are buying to create environments that lead to less jerkiness because that's where people want to hang out, minus the kill servers. If there are going to be sites that are like jerks welcome, we trumpet <laughs> our bottom rating on credibility of Alexa, great, that's where people can go to do that kind of thing. So in conclusion, we are together operating in a way that adds up to a system. And it's reminiscent of this uh, rather famed Harvard Yale game in which at halftime uh, in the Harvard stands, uh, members of the uh, Harvard uh, uh, sort of spirit team handed out pieces of paper like the North Korean games so that people could hold them out at a key moment and send a message to Yale. Although it turns out that they weren't from the Harvard spirit team, they were from the Yale spirit team. So at the uh, signal, people <laughs> And to me, it's just a great exemplar of the ways in which we can be so happily trying to do something and thinking we're doing the best thing. And it's, it's kind of meaningless to take it alone, but when you add it all up, it leads to something that is a less result. And figuring out how to make it so that when we are cheering doing something, the message we produce is not this societal message to me. That's really the challenge, and that's what I would think we should name it. Thank you very much. Yay. So we have about seven or eight minutes, and 
I guess we can take some questions from or comments from the audience. If you could try not to be jerky, <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't be. No. I will do my best to try. <laughs> so the question that I have, just it's not so much about this, uh, I guess the stalking, it's the point that you made earlier about retention of information and document destruction. So I work in the financial industry, and you know one of the guidance that came out a few years, a few years ago from FINRA is that well, all the communication on social media sites have to be retained by the financial services institution if our rep is on that site. And so the question that I have is, um, at this point, some firms have enabled their personnel to communicate, they're retaining their information without getting consent from that person's network. Um, so just wanted to get your thoughts on that, because I think farm industry is another one that's subject to cutting similar requirements, and I think there are some other industries that are also dealing with the same issues. And so when we talk about the data destruction issue or how you can control your, what you say on the internet and, and all the different ways in which you present yourself, yes. one of the things you're not thinking about is that there's all these corporate institutions that are retaining your comments yes. and communication networks. So I want to get your thoughts on that and see any yes. Well, at the most abstract layer, what you point out is yet another great example of the disjunct between the legal environment and an environment we call reality. And um, that's certainly what we've seen between, in America, Title 17, which covers copyright, and the reality of what people do with music and bits online. And trying to resolve that can be really tricky. And it's like, which should win? Should reality be bent to meet the law? Or should the law try to be more in sync with whatever reality is? And then copyright is a tough question because uh, the harm that it is, if harm it is, is uh, more utilitarian than it is sort of moral in the American copyright framework. But don't get me started on that. Um, and I think in financial services, that's another great example. Or in, in you know corporate environments more generally, you have CEOs that end up blogging during their quiet period, which I, for those of you like that aren't into this, you think that's like you send a kid upstairs. It's like the entire company has to go upstairs for a little while because it's about to be acquired. So it's just kind of time I'm out. And they don't know it. And I, to me, I would like to see over the longer term ways to shape the law to meet the reality that says people are going to be engaging in ways that are informal. Now, there's going to be some things like financial transactions for which to be able to delete what you do is not fair. It can let you cheat. It can let you do insider trading. But I would rather see standards than rules so that we retain the hell out of everything in case somebody's doing something wrong. That kind of concerns me. And I should defer to Lisa on more specific <laughs> lawyerly advice on the question of financial data retention and that it might drive a firm to retain stuff without even observing the niceties of informing interlocutors outside the firm that they might be retaining it. Well, I think that it ties into your student's project of moderator in a really interesting way because I had never thought about the idea of tying in your online persona with your real world financial transactions. And I think a lot of people would be a lot more careful with their online interactions if they realized it had a direct impact, perhaps on their literal financial credit rating. Um, so as these two cultures converge, I think that the norms of online behavior will also change. Because now we have this dual mode, army and civilian type persona that some people pursue. And uh, while I don't like to see all innovation and creativity stifled online, I think that it's kind of like the social contract you enter, to, enter into with these social networking sites. Um, where there needs to be better disclosure up front that this is going to happen. I wasn't aware that an instruction came from FINRA to require financial services companies to retain their social type of data. So I think that's something that needs to not be buried in paragraph 56 of the terms of use. Great question. So we've talked a lot about uh, false and negative. And um, I, I, you know, I've run uh, division business on advertising for major local advertisers. Um, certainly, we have a lot of uh, hotels, and uh, in the travel industry reviews are so uh, mature. Uh, thanks to trip advisors, um, it's, um, really the secondary tactic that comes out of that is, is the false positive. 
enforcement you had the, the local the local filters over the jails you know clearly had the most controversy so where do you see cost ponds are going yeah. and what they do lisa's you totally the right person at play she you should just tell your story okay now can you just clarify a little bit how you're using the term false positives in reputation review sites yeah just uh, just loading reviews you know false content you know not uh, collected Correctly or not collecting, you know, by consumer leaving, leaving content online. But it's, in the medical context, a false positive is usually a bad thing. I mean, a false anything is a bad thing, but sure. it's very bad to get a positive because it means like, oh my God, I have that condition. Yep. And here by that you mean my condition is my hotel is set to suck. Just but it's a false positive. Exactly. Much like right. you saw in 60 This is funny because often a review is positive or negative, so it's actually a false negative review, false which, which makes it a false positive. Just, just anyway. Okay. Well, that is an FTC violation. I think it is an FTC violation, in my opinion. Uh, perfect. Um, so the question is, uh, what about the problem of this secondary market in um, reputation review? And I mean, I think this is one of the most fascinating issues. Um, you bring up the FTC. So in um, December 2010, um, the FTC issued new guides for Section 1 of the FTC, which says you have to disclose affiliations, endorsements, and consideration received for endorsements and testimonials. So if you have a financial interest in the content that you are publishing, you have to disclose it or face enforcement action from the FTC. And what enforcement action looks like from the FTC can range anywhere from maybe a $5,000 fine for a repeat offender, maybe you're a corrupt blogger who, who didn't tell everyone that you got a free Samsung Nexus, to when the FTC gets involved, they get involved. I mean, they find uh, Playdom, which is a online social gaming site, $5 million um, for retaining data about children. But what Jonathan is referring to is litigation that I've been in with a reputation website called Ripoff Report. And they have a super high Alexa rating. I think it's under 100. So they go all over their website and they threaten you right on the website. They say, we will never take reports down. We will fight you to the Supreme Court. We have never lost a court case. And behind the scenes, getting to your FTC point, they sell a product and the product is that if you don't like what is being written about you on the website, they will sell you a corporate advocacy program, which costs about $30,000 a year. So me being a blogger, I'd spoken what on What do you this. get for that money? They will advertise that they will change your search results from a negative to a positive. What they will sell you is 300 words in the meta tag for your page that will bury the negative content and bring up in the Google search result a positive snippet saying the Berkman Institute is committed to consumer satisfaction. So can you report ripoff report to ripoff report? You cannot. Okay. You cannot. People have tried. The, there's a lot of anecdotal data. I, I had a lawsuit against that because I, I just felt sad. I mean, people would email me all the time saying, is there anything that can be done? It's killing my business. And these are people, they're mom and pop stores. They, they're not going to purchase a, a reputation defender type program to seed the internet with positive results. Um, I mean, I don't know how far you want me to take this, but basically it, it's, such a, it's such a lucrative business that they, they're very protective of it. Um, we got them to change some of their practices. If you want to talk about it, I will after the panel, but they're so serious about it. They actually sued me. So they sued me for bringing this lawsuit. So now I'm in litigation with them. The one thing they haven't done, which is interesting, is they haven't filed their own ripoff report against me, even though they did about some of my witnesses. They actually filed ripoff reports about my witnesses to intimidate them. Because they know they'll be the number one Google search results. I feel like I should Mirandize you right now. Like, <laughs> you should just, you know. But. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I think I'll stop here. Yes, okay. <laughs> but it does illustrate nicely, too, you've got a problem. The real world used to have a way of dealing with it and still does. And here Lisa is in kind of death grip meta litigation now over it. And there's also. It's an arms race. Yeah, and there's also ways in which we're trying to figure out how to deal with it online. 
online problems maybe can have online solutions, but we, you know, haven't figured that out yet. Uh, which is, I guess, maybe why we'll have to wait till How next year I'm to like, figure out. I'm like a moderator, by the way. Sorry, um, we'll be on the Raider Raider. Uh huh. Raider Raider. Raider, Raider. Raider. I'll put you in touch with my students. That's great. Cool. Well, thank you, thank you all for coming, and uh, let's keep the dialogue going online. Thanks. I recorded it.